Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to begin with presentations from each of the panelists and then uh, move to a, uh, to a less formal uh, conversation. So I'm going to begin by asking Peter to, uh, to make his presentation. Okay, hello all. <clears throat> Delighted to be here. So, uh, whoops, that's not the first slide. There we go. I'm going to talk about the paradox of thrift. Uh, and of course, uh, this is a Keynesian concept, uh, a very Keynesian talk. Uh, but I'll explain it for those of you who don't know. Uh, the idea, of course, is that uh, when one person tries to uh, save money, then uh, he prepares or she pre he prepares for the future. But when everybody saves more, then no one ends up saving more, just income falls. And this is a familiar uh, view here. And what my innovation uh, or my point of my talk here is to try to extend this to the world economy. So looking at American data, you can see that the fall, the dramatic fall in the ratio of employment to population, this is a familiar figure probably to most people there. And I see this as a fall in the demand for labor. Uh, I don't quite know how you would represent it as a supply shift of, uh, of labor because it's so sudden. The kind of con uh, ideas that people write, write about these days are that something messed up in the financial system, uh, but while the financial system had a very sharp uh, hit in uh, late 2008, the financial system was back up and running by the beginning of 2009. Different prices, of course, but coherency between the, uh, the way it was. Not labor skills, which are very much put that uh, education is bad, and people can't, we have what's called structural unemployment. It's hard to see how we could have lost all those skills in those few years. So it's really a fall in aggregate demand of the sort that Keynes analyzed earlier on. So I'm going to do a little bit of mathematics here, just very simply. Uh, those of you, this is uh, kind of very elementary stuff. You can break down the uh, composition of the uh, of demand, of, of uh, national income on the expenditure side or on the income side. And uh, so at the top is Y is consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports from the ex ex expenditure side. And then from the in income side, the same thing is due to consumption plus saving and taxes. And so if you just equate them, since they're both equal to Y, cancel out C, then you get the third equation that investment equals savings plus taxes minus government spending plus net imports because it's on the other side of the equation. And so down below, I've changed the notation a bit. I hope that's not confusing, uh, but it's something I always did for my students. So that the uh, first equation below the notion of changing notation is the same as the one above it, just in different notation. And it says that investment is equal to savings, but you can subdivide savings in three different parts. Private saving, SP, government saving, SG, and foreign saving, SF. And so you can see what happened in the decade behind us, the decade of the 2000s, the United States dissaved a lot, that is to say, it borrowed a lot of money, it, uh, sp it spent money, it reduced taxes, so it borrowed, so it was dissaving, it was borrowing rather than lending, so on. And then there was the choice whether that would be if investment was going to stay 
roughly constant in the short term, was that going to come out of private savings or foreign savings? And as it turned out, it came from foreign savings, the big increase in the deficit and the capital flow from China to the United States. Since the uh, crisis, then pr both private and government savings have risen a little bit. So that gives us a little more play at the moment. Then the final equation, which is, tells us about this, is just to move the net imports back over to the other side of the equation, which reverses the sign. So it's investment plus capital exports have to be funded by either private or government savings. And so you can see that applies to China, Germany, uh, et cetera. Uh, for that, it's the sum of private and government savings where the distinction is not always so important as the private savings are often, uh, even though they show up as private savings, are the result of government policies for that. And so we can see how this works out in this graph, as you can see it, because these are the capital exports coming in blue from China and in orange from, from the Euro area. And you could see they were both rising a little bit in the early part of the decade and then diverged a lot. And China was the big capital exporter in the uh, later part of the uh, decade. You can see how high that got enormously, uh, whereas Germany wasn't. And now they're in the little of a changing, changing the order of things. And so this is the kind of graph of the equation that I gave you uh, just before. And so China is beginning to ex export, have lower net exports as the demand for labor is rising and the prices are rising internally. So you have a rise not in the nominal exchange rate between China and the US, but in the real exchange rate as the cost of production in China goes up a little bit. And so there's less capital, ex less net exports coming out, less surplus, as you see, coming down. And that's being largely offset, or in this graph you can see entirely offset by the rise of Germany as a big exporter. And so that leads me in this very short presentation here to the conclusion of this which is what happens is that as we look at the world today, China, Germany, and Japan are big capital exporters for that, big net exporters uh, for their, the full thing. Southern Europe as a debtor area is being forced to be a net exporter to, be, to pay off its debts. And so Southern Europe is getting to be a net exporter earlier too. And so that graph actually, I spoke of it as Germany, but it's actually the Euro area. So that's composed of a large part of Germany and a smaller part from Southern Europe. But everybody wants to be a net exporter or is forced to be a net exporter. And the US also wants to export more, as you can see floating around. And I just couldn't resist quoting a uh, recent article by Martin Bar Bailey and Barry Bosworth in the Journal of Economic Perspectives in which they said the US needed to export more because of the weakness of aggregate demand. And that strikes me as exactly backwards uh, that uh, you want to have, uh, if you want to have more aggregate demand, you could have more aggressive fiscal policy in the United States. And I even wonder if this means that they're going over to the supply side sense of the fall that I showed you in a previous slide and thinking that in fact we're in a position of what's known in the trade as secular stagnation. Uh, 
And I think secular stagnation is a much less accurate way to say it than a paradox of thrift. But the rise then in global savings has produced an international paradox of thrift. And the paradox, of course, just to repeat what I said at the beginning, is that if any one country wants to expand, other countries can absorb it. So the early history of Japan uh, saying it, as its economy progressed, and my colleague, uh, Mr. Kuhn, knows all about that. And the, the, uh, there, they could be absorbed by the rest of the world, and that worked well for everyone. But when everybody tries to be a exporter, then nobody gets to export, and you have what I call an international paradox of thrift. If you don't like the terminology, the Keynesian terminology, uh, then just think of it as a little bit of arithmetic. Uh, if all the big countries are exporters, who are the importers? Thank you. We're going to turn it over to Bill. Thank you. OK, thanks very much for uh, inviting me to speak here. It's sort of the middle of night for me, so uh, we hope we make sense in the cloud of the jet lag. Um, I have a background in uh, bike racing, uh, cycling in Europe. And I remember once many years ago, uh, we were out training, and uh, I stopped at a little border. We stopped at a little border town along the French-German border for a cup of tea, which we would do in the middle of all of our exercise. And um, I remember I saw in the city square a plaque on a public building, and it was in French, but it was translated to the, it translates as the, to the glorious patriot sons of Arlon, uh, who were slaughtered by the assassins of Germany. And this is a, a building which was uh, less than a kilometer from the German border. And even though I'd grown up in a uh, post-war period and you know, my, my parents were severely affected by the war, it really brought home to me that the, this, you know, we're talking in the 1970s, late 70s here, it really brought home to me that, that th these countries were so, so severely influenced by the Second World War. Um, And, and, th and that's influenced my own academic work as I understand what happened in the, about 60 years after you know, Jean Monnet decided that there should be a, a political solution to uh, what was the uh, crisis in Europe in, during the Second World War. So you know, the hypothesis that I'll briefly introduce is that the Euro crisis was a crisis long before the crisis. It was a dis it's been a disaster really all along. And the motivation has been uh, extremely uh, suspect. And the, the motivation that has led to this and monetary union should not have led to that outcome. So the first thing that, uh, uh, that sets, sets the Europeans apart from other nations is that they've always had an obsession with fixed exchange rates. And even when the Bretton Woods system collapsed when President Nixon suspended the gold window in the US in 1971, the, the Europeans were wanting to hang on to that system of fixed exchange rates. And one of the reasons for that is because, for better or for worse, mostly worse, they had the common agricultural policy, which was really a sop to their, uh, the strength of their rural lobby and it wasn't just the French farmers, it was also the Bavarian farmers, extremely influential. And of course, if you run a system of harmonised agricultural prices, then uh, exchange rate exposure pays havoc with that. And so, you know, there was some common sense in their obsession with fixed exchange rates. And the other obsession, of course, is that uh, uh, France was sick to death of being invaded by Germany. 
and they wanted to, to do everything they could to neuter any prospect that German would invade them. They'd, I think, from memory, six times since Bismarck, they'd been across the border. And the, this was, this, it comes back to the plaque I saw on the public building. This was an intense motivation. Uh, Charles de Gaulle had an, had an obsession with that. And from the German point of view, they were so ashamed of what they had done in the Second World War that as, in terms of national pride, they had nothing to hang a hat on in terms of the, their proximity to their European partners who they had trampled all over in the, in the worst ways possible. And so the only thing the Germans had going for them was their economy and the strength of the Deutschmark and the strength of the economy. And that, that, was, that was the vehicle that they wanted to use as their play back into sort of European respectability. And the EMU, the integration, became their vehicle, which was compounded a bit later in the late 80s by the threat that French and others saw when Germany re reunified. The, 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 the political motivation for Germany was, was overwhelming to become a good citizen again and be you know, part of the European project. So this had been going on since, since the Treaty of Rome and before that even in the late 40s. Uh, the and I mentioned here the uh, Werner report. The, the, the Pierre Werner was the Prime Minister of Luxembourg and he, even his selection to be the first person to, to come up with a plan for the monetary union was a, was a compromise because the French wanted to to, to be in charge of the committee and the Germans wanted to be in charge of the committee. And all the way through the history, uh, I think I've read almost every official document in, in all of the major languages since this time. So all the way through the nuances of these meetings and the minutes are telling us all of these and the briefing documents are telling us that this French-German obsession with each other was driving the shows. But Pierre Werner, uh, uh, he, he became friends of de Gaulle in 1965 when they had the so-called empty chair crisis where France spat the dummy and uh, wouldn't attend any meetings of the European uh, community uh, because they'd, well, it's too detailed to go into, but uh, uh, Werner was the one that persuaded them to come back into the fold and they were going to come back in anyway, but they needed to have their tantrum and get it over and done with. But Werner's report was the first plan for the, for the, for the, uh, uh, union, and uh, it, it was very Keynesian. It, it explicitly understood that if you were going to have a federation like in the US or like in Australia, then you needed to, and you were going to have one central bank that was issuing the currency, then you also needed a federal fiscal authority who would be able to, to spend and tax in such a way that you could run a, st a, ca a macro stabilisation policy. In other words, if you had what are called asymmetrical spending shocks to one region or another, then the federal government could, was the one that could smooth them out and ensure that there was nobody going to be left behind. Werner understood that in, and his committee understood that. Uh, the, the report from McDougall followed that up in, uh, in 1977. McDougall was a... Uh, a British industrialist, a, a peak body president, as I understand. And his report also was very explicit in terms of what would be a viable design for a monetary union in Europe. And that, that meant you had to have a federal fiscal capacity. Couldn't do without it, he said, the report said. And the conclusion of the McDougall report was that Europe wasn't ready for a monetary union because he, his committee couldn't see a way forward where the political uh, and the, the sort of nationalist and xenophobic interests of the various countries, and in particular France and Germany, could be brought to a position where they would surrender their national sovereignty in fiscal affairs to such a state that they would agree to have, well, it would be Brussels, running fiscal policy. So he, was, he, he said it's essential to have that and, and it won't happen 
Uh, the snake in the European monetary system disaster relates to them trying to hang on through the 70s. In 1972, they invented this thing called the snake, where they had upper and lower bounds of where they had allowed the exchange rates to fluctuate against each other, and then the central banks were committed to intervene to keep the fluctuate within the, the bands. And of course, that became a, a, an exercise in gaming each other, because the the Germans who were uh, uh, driven by sort of what we call the, 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 the Bundesbank culture, they were obsessed with price stability and they weren't going to go into bat for, the, say, the French currency because for them it would mean the, the official interventions in the foreign exchange market would be they'd have to be selling Deutschmarks all the time because they were, had the stronger trade sector and they feared that that would lead to inf to inflation. By now, monetarism has started to take over, and the, the, the sort of obsession with monetary uh, money targeting was, was starting to enter the scene. And uh, what the snake, there were so many realignments, and what, what, what was learnt from that is that without capital controls, there is very limited chance of being able to stabilise in a fixed way exchange rates between these countries running separate fiscal policies. And then what then came across the, the bowels of the integration debate and the European project, which was all about having peace in, in Europe, what then intervened was what I call the monetarist ideology. So the Thatcherism in Britain and in the academy where I have been all my life, the work of Friedman, the Chicago School and all of the non-economists in the audience. This, the, you know, the, the loathing of uh, activism in terms of fiscal policy, the idea that price stability was the only objective, and that uh, if you maintain stable inflation, then all the rest of it would take care of itself. And that intersected the integration debate, and that led to the uh, report from Jacques Delors in 1989, and that's often been, and that laid the blueprint for the Maastricht Treaty in 1991. And Delora's, his report has often been juxtaposed with the uh, Werner and McDougall reports, and they are quite different because, because the most, most prominent features of those earlier designs are missing in the Delora report. What, what's that? The idea that you have a federal fiscal authority. In the Delora report, it said that counter stabilisation can happen at the national level, not at the federal level, and they assume that the fluctuations of the fiscal position, what, what economists call automatic stabilisers, so when the, the uh, activity declines, tax revenue declines and deficits will rise or surpluses will fall, they assumed that they would be enough within what they thought would be the normal output gaps over a cycle to be sufficient to maintain stability. And of course overlaying all of that was the political dislike of each other it's the most curious thing that they'd want to go into a partnership where they really were deeply suspicious of each other. And of course the Germans were deeply suspicious of the, the Italians in principle. And there's you know, secret papers that have been released re relatively recently where a lot of the German cabinet documents come out and they're quite scathing about the Italians. It's quite amazing what they say. And so they wanted to not only uh, not have a federal fiscal authority, but also stop the national governments having very much latitude in the, their fiscal decision making. And this led to the so-called Stability and Growth Pact, which started off as uh, a stability pact from Theo Weigel, who was the German finance minister at the time. And of course, the French spat the dummy again and said, no, we've got to have some growth for political reasons because they were mired in recession. And uh, uh, Mitterrand was about to face an election and, he would have, and so they put growth in there. And in, the, in my 2000 book with my colleague, uh, Jan Mauskin, we say the Stability Growth Pact, it's neither stability nor growth. What followed then was what I call the convergence farce. And this is when they all had to, through the 90s, up until what was so-called stage three of the treaty, where they took on the single currency. And this was where the, the governments had to meet the so-called convergence criteria, which were out, laid out in the Stability and Growth Pact. And of course there was all this counting tricks and even the Germans were trying to 
uh, revalue their gold so that they could then get tidy profits so that they could write it off against their deficit. Nobody met the convergence criteria in a strict sense, yet they all just turned a blind eye to it and went ahead with stage three anyway. The crisis was already there. Okay, l the last part of the talk. The first, first several years of the crisis uh, of the Eurozone were, were setting up the disaster. The, the, the Germans uh, uh, knew damn well. They knew better. They were smarter than the rest of the nations in a way because they knew that if now that they'd lost their exchange rate, which the Bundesbank for years had been manipulating in a very efficient way to make sure it was always undervalued so their export sector would be strong, they realised without that they had to come up with some other way of, be of m maintaining their competitiveness and they did it through a series of domestic reforms pioneered by the uh, senior executive of Volkswagen, Peter Hartz. And these were the so-called Hartz 1 to 4 reforms, where basically they attacked the wages and uh, capacity of workers to get real wages. They created so-called mini jobs, which were extremely low paid jobs. And they basically did what we now call as internal devaluation. And of course, the rest of the nations were cruising along uh, allowing real wages to grow with productivity, which is the normal state. The Germans were undermining their, really gaming their other partners and uh, setting up the sort of things that uh, Peter mentioned in terms of these ex uh, external imbalances. The other thing, of course, was the Germans and the French were put into an excessive deficit procedure in 2003 because they were consistently above the Maastricht criteria. And, and, and they colluded through the way in which the ECOFIN Council works to basically get the rules changed. It was a, an amazing piece of hypocrisy. Theo Weigel said at one time, he said, he said, three doesn't mean three. In other words, the three percent. He said, I didn't really mean three. I didn't, I didn't ever mention 60 percent. And this was this sort of ad hoc flexibility going right through the system. Okay, so the crisis occurred. And the last thing I'll talk about are the, the, the options facing them. The, the three options broadly are continue as is. In other words, the whole, whole design of the monetary system with the stability impact rules, which are even tighter than they were initially specified, the lack of a federal fiscal authority basically predicates or biases the whole system to stagnation. It is incapable of meeting a serious ag aggregate demand shock, as we saw in 2008, in its current form. So, the, so in its current form, it's biased towards stagnation. They could, they could keep the euro if they brought in a federal fiscal authority, like you have in the US, like we have in Australia. But, and so that would serve to stabilise aggregate demand when there are variations that are asymmetric across regions, it would, it, it would uh, allow its deficit to rise or fall uh, uh, in terms of how much idle capacity there was, and that, that could work. But of course, that's never going to happen because of the politics. The other thing that's being talked about at the moment is this sort of thing, so-called overt monetary financing. And, uh, I don't use the words printing money, but that's what it, it's, in other words, uh, the European Central Bank would fund government deficits and, and allow the governments to meet these asymmetric demand shocks at the national level. Uh, that would work too. In effect, the only reason the Eurozone has survived is because the, Euro the European Central Bank basically breached their rules. They don't say they did, but they breached the no bailout clauses with their security markets program, which began in 2011. And this was buying all the government debt up of threatened countries in the secondary bond market. Now, they could just, they could just buy it in the primary issue market and get it, be done with it. And that would work also. That's not going to happen either. And so the third option, which is, I believe, the preferred option, and I think Martin will uh, dispute this, is that the best option for all of the countries is to go to Brussels uh, and agree on an orderly dismantling of the Eurozone. Restore currency sovereignty at the national level where the politics and the cultures are. It's not an optimal currency union. The cultures are quite different and they can never cooperate in a political sense, in an effective political sense, without gaming each other continually. 
And so it would be much better to restore currency sovereignty at the national level where, where there is an optimal currency area at a, at a political and cultural level, restore their central bank's capacity to run independent monetary policy so that you don't get the absurd situation where the European Central Bank is basically setting a community-wide interest rate that suits Germany under pressure from the Bundesbank, which doesn't suit Spain and Greece and Ireland and, and was too low for those countries and led to their housing busts, bubbles and busts. And so it's much better if they decentralise the monetary policy back to national level, decentralise fiscal policy back to national level where it is now, but not restrict it and, and allow the countries to float their exchange rates, let them adjust to the trade and competitive realities and get back to restoring some prosperity because it's quite ridiculous for the future of these countries to have 60% youth unemployment. That's a disaster for political stability in the future. So of all of the options, the three options I outlined would all work, but two are politically impossible and culturally impossible. And, and the third one is the only effective one that suits the political realities. Thank you. Richard? Well, good afternoon. I was told to speak in this session less than 24 hours ago. And I happen to have a presentation with two parts to it, balance sheet recession and a QE trap. And I thought this balance sheet recession part will fit nicely with, with this session. But if you want me to talk about the other one, I can do that as well. Uh, <clears throat> I have a slightly different interpretation about the currency union and the, it, its troubles uh, compared to Bill in that you know, a lot of people talk about how, how difficult the currency union has been, how complicated, how complex, and all of that. But those of us living, who lived through what I call balance sheet recession in Japan and use that framework to understand what happened in Europe, it comes out very, very simply. That Maastricht Treaty simply was not designed to handle balance sheet recession. And <clears throat> once this problem is understood and applied correctly, I think we can get to the core of the problem, why we face the problem we face in Europe and what we need to do about it. And I start with the premise that I think Euro, creation of Euro is one of the greatest achievements of mankind, especially in view of what Bill just mentioned about so much animosity between so many cultures within the Eurozone, and they actually sat together, brightest minds together, to get this thing mo uh, moving. I thought that was the greatest achievement. But like any complicated, uh, massive achievements, like making a you know, jumbo jet or Airbus A380 or so, once you start making the airplane fly, then you realize that there are some glitches. And I would argue that there are two glitches that needs to be repaired. And, those, and once those two glitches are repaired, I think Eurozone can function quite nicely as a currency zone. First, what do I mean by, <coughs> oh, sorry. Europe also experienced a massive housing bubble, as, as we all know. And this picture shows what happened to house prices in Ireland, uh, Greece, Spain, compared to 1995. Irish prices went to 514, uh, Spanish prices, uh, sorry, uh, Greek prices 342, uh, Spanish prices 303. And, and then in the same currency zone, on the same uh, monetary policy, same central bank, same interest rates, German prices actually fell during this period from 1995 to 2005 by full 10%. And I think this is one of the problems that leads to the problem we face today. With the collapse of the bubble, what do you typically expect? Well, asset prices collapsed, liabilities remain, the private sector all decide to pay down debt. And that's how what I call balance sheet recession starts that everybody's trying to repair their balance sheets all at the same time, and no one's borrowing money. And when you, oh, sorry, I have to 
sorry for this, I was suddenly told this, so I have to use this, whatever chart that I, I had with me at the moment. This chart shows the private sector of Eurozone countries viewed from the flow of funds chart. And in this chart, there's a horizontal line going across at zero. Below zero are the people borrowing money. Above zero are the people saving money. But because there are so many countries in the Eurozone, I don't have time to go through each one of them. What I did here is put all the private sector lines into one line. And so the red line here is the entire uh, Spanish private sector. Green line is the entire Irish private sector, and so forth. And during the bubble days, you can see that they are all below zero, significantly below zero. That means they were borrowing and spending like crazy. And once the bubble burst, the entire private sector of all these zones are significantly above zero, even with near zero interest rates. And what does that uh, above zero mean? They're either saving money or paying down debt at zero interest rates. So that fully qualifies, in my view, as balance sheet recession, because people are no longer maximizing profits, they're minimizing debt. <clears throat> and once, this, once we reach this state, we typically expect government bond yields to come down. Why do they come down during balance sheet recession? Well, bond yields come down in balance sheet recession because if you're a fund manager in, 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 in a country managing uh, pension funds or life insurance, you're typically under certain gov government regulations that you cannot take too much foreign exchange risk. You can take some, of course, but not too much. You cannot take too much uh, principal risk. That means you cannot put all your money in stocks. You have to have some fixed income. And if you're one of those managers, and if the private sector as a group is not borrowing money at all, where can you place your money? The only, government, only borrower left in these situations are typically the government. And so even though you might not like it, you end up buying government bonds and bond yields start coming down. That first happened in Japan, the orange lines. And when the Japanese bond yields came down to those ridiculously low levels, many American hedge funds, who have nothing better to do, decided that this has to be a bubble. They shorted the market many times. All of them lost a huge sum of money. Even though Japanese government debt was skyrocketing, budget deficit was always over 5 to 10%. They always lost money because this is not a bubble. This is what you expect during a balance sheet recession because all the excess savings, the unborrowed savings in the private sector ended up going to government bond market, pushed the bond yields down, encouraged the government to borrow and spend to act as a borrower of last resort. Because as uh, Peter mentioned at the very beginning, if everybody's saving money, someone at the end of the day has to borrow money to keep the GDP from collapsing. And that's the role of government. But for some reason, that did not happen in the Eurozone. Many of the countries in the Eurozone had their government bond yields go sky high instead of going down. Even though, as you saw in the previous charts, private sectors of those economies were saving massive amounts of sum. I mean, everybody talks about the size of the budget deficit. Very few people actually look at the size of the private sector savings. But in the case of Ireland, private sector is saving nearly 14% of GDP at zero interest rates. The budget deficit is only 7.4%. So if half of the savings went to the government bond market, the bonds yield should have come down quite drastically. Same with Spain, same with Portugal. Now, why did that not happen in in the Eurozone. Well, Eurozone has one problem that no one else in the world has ever faced before, and that is there are 17 government bond markets within the same currency zone. So <clears throat> if, if I were a fund manager in Japan or UK or uh, in the United States or Sweden, I, the only choice I have, given the, uh, given the restrictions I mentioned, would be to buy your own government bond. But in the Eurozone, you don't have to buy your own government bond. You can buy someone else's. So if I'm a Spanish fund manager and if I don't like what's happening to the Spanish deficit, I just buy German government bonds. And I was in Spain uh, some years ago and actually tested this uh, thesis on the fund managers collected uh, to, for my seminar. And I asked them, how many of you today are moving money from Spain to Germany? And guess how many hands went up? Everyone raised hands. It was that bad. And they kind of looked at each other and said, oh no, right? <laughs> If you're the only one doing it, it's kind of cute, but if, if everybody's doing it, it's a, it's a disaster. And so that's one problem in the Eurozone, this crazy capital flight between the country, uh, between the government bond markets that no one else had to face before the uh, creation of Eurozone. But there's another problem, and that is that it was actually Germany that fell into balance, balance sheet recession first at the very beginning of the creation of Eurozone. And a lot of people have forgotten that Germany actually faced a massive bubble year 2000. 
in what we call the dot-com bubble in the United States. I understand a lot of people in Germany call it telecom bubble. And this is what happened to that market. At that time, um, Germany had this market called Neue Markt, it's German equivalent of uh, NASDAQ. And it went up massively, as you can see, went from 1,000 to nearly 10,000 within two years. And then soon enough, it lost 97% of its value. Now, that devastated the German uh, balance sheets, both private and public. And this is the German flow of funds data. As, as, as I mentioned to you earlier, horizontal line above zero are the savers, below zero are the borrowers. And if you add the four lines together, you're supposed to get zero. That's how these things are put together. And before the bursting of the bubble, German households are saving, but German companies are borrowing. But after the bursting of the bubble, as I show in that uh, heavy, heavy line, German corporates go straight into the positive range, meaning that even with the lowest interest rates they have seen in the post-war world, because ECB then brought rates down to 2%, German companies were paying down debt, increasing savings to repair their balance sheets. And households also increased their savings. By 2005, 2006, German private sector was saving nearly 10% of GDP at the lowest interest rates they have ever seen. And if you look at this chart, this is a German households that uh, apparently was more involved. This chart, I show the blue bars as their savings, orange bars, their borrowings. And if so, the blue bars goes further to the north, that means they're increasing savings. Orange bars goes further to the south, that means they are increasing borrowings. And the, the net line is the one you see in the middle with a lot of uh, circles. Until two, year 2000, until the bursting of the bubble, you see German households, conservative people, saving lots of money, but they were also borrowing money to buy houses and so forth. But after the uh, bursting of the bubble year 2000, you see no borrowings at all. Uh, if I may hear, you know, there's nothing here. Or if I may use this chart, there's nothing here. No one is borrowing money in Germany. This is the reason why German house prices fell. Because if no one's borrowing money to buy houses, then of course house prices will fall. So that's how serious the balance sheet recession was in Germany. But at that time, no one in Germany or in most of the Western world knew anything about balance sheet recession. And <clears throat> on top of that, because of the 3% rule that German government imposed on, on the rest of the uh, Maastricht Treaty uh, members, it cannot increase their fiscal deficit very much either. So <clears throat> the economy continued to weaken. Uh, and in order to save the German economy, ECB brought rates down, 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 but as you can see, it produced zero results because there are no borrowers in Germany, neither on the corporate side or in the uh, household side. But there were a lot of other borrowers, and this is what happened to Spain. If you look at this chart, you notice that Spanish households were very conservative people to begin with, but when they saw interest rates brought down to 2%, they couldn't resist. And our economic theory tells us that if you have a clean balance sheets, willing bankers, and if central bank bring rates down to these ridiculously low levels, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to borrow money and invest in the real estate. And that's basically what happened in Spain. Massive borrowing, to, and that, of course, then started the uh, uh, Spanish housing bubble. And this is our Irish case. Irish people were very conservative to begin with, but when they saw 2% interest rates, they couldn't resist either. So they borrowed massively, and that was the Irish housing bubble. Now, what happens when all these people respond to central bank monetary easing, increase borrowing massively? That means money multiply is positive, and that means money, money supply will grow rapidly as well. And <clears throat> what happens when money supply grows rapidly? Your wages and prices also go up. And this chart shows what happened to non-German Eurozone money supply growth. The top line is non-German Eurozone money supply growth. And, and the next line, the dotted purple line, is the money supply growth in Germany. And as you can see, there's a huge divergence uh, over this period. German money supply only grew very slowly, but money supply, rest of the ex-Germany uh, grew very, very rapidly. And so if money supply grows rapidly, what happens to wages and prices? Of course, they go up. If money supply grows very slowly, what happens to your wages and prices? It doesn't go up very much. By, by the end of 10 years of this, German companies, German wages, German prices are highly competitive. So they were able to export their way out. And <clears throat> this is what happened to German uh, trade balances. 
against Europe, massive improvement. Against North America, little improvement. Against Asia, actually deterioration. Uh, but that's how Germany was able, able to come out of its balance sheet recession. So what this means is that there are actually two problems, the two glitches I, I mentioned to earlier. One is this capital flight problems within the 17 government bonds, bond markets within the Eurozone, and the fact that Maastricht Treaty was not designed to deal with balance sheet recession. So what, do you, what, what can we do with this problem? On the, this capital flight problem, I've been arguing for some time that Eurozone should introduce different risk weights for its institutional investors. That if those investors hold on to your own government bond, or to their own government bond, risk weight will be still zero. But if they buy someone else's government bond, the risk weight will be a little higher. To encourage certain amount of money to stay within the Eurozone, and as you saw at the beginning, if half of their savings went to their own government bond market, bond yields will come down, and we would have faced none of the problems we faced the last five, four or five years. Now, you could argue that, well, how can you, this is capital controls. But you know, risk weights are used in so many different ways all around the world today. And I think this is a very small price to pay. Uh, I'm not preventing people from buying uh, other people's government bond, but just give a little incentive so that some of the savings will stay in their own government bond market so that those fund managers who operate more like the fund managers in the UK, Japan, or United States, because in those countries, this foreign exchange risk kind of ring-fenced their government bond market, which was not the case in the Eurozone. And the other measure I suggest is that for those countries that are certified to be in balance sheet recession by, let's say, a group of experts within the, within the EU, then those countries should be allowed to run larger fiscal deficit with a full blessing from the EU. Now, if it gets full blessing from the EU, you are doing the right things, and with the different risk weights, I'm sure that some of the uh, savings in those countries will go to their own government bond market. Rates will be lowered. That will encourage the government to run larger fiscal stimulus, and then that will keep those economies from falling into the deflationary spirals that, that they did. Now, both of those measures don't cost German taxpayers anything. And so Germans have no reason to oppose it, I think. <clears throat> and once they are in it, ECB, ECB's monetary policy will not be distorted by uh, one or two member countries who happen to be in balance sheet recession, and you have to kind of adjust their uh, monetary policy to, to save those guys, it end up creating bubbles elsewhere. If German government, for example, in 2001, 2003, uh, that period, were able to put in the fiscal stimulus, then ECB wouldn't have to bring uh, rates down to such low levels to create bubbles elsewhere. And German banks won't have to be buying uh, toxic CDOs in, in United States or those uh, Spanish papers. Uh, because at that time, if you put yourself in the position of German, government, German banks, private sector is saving 10% of GDP, which is coming to, in your way. But private sector as a group is saving 10% of GDP, so you can't lend them any more money. Government only borrows 3% of that. The remaining 7%, they had to put it to somewhere else. And that's how German banks ended up lending to Spain, ended up buying toxic CDOs in the United States. But those could have been avoided if German government was borrowing more. So <clears throat> putting this together, I would argue that just uh, having two glitches corrected, I think Eurozone can function quite nicely. I have been very pessimistic on Eurozone since 2003, when my first book came out, it's titled Balance Sheet Recession. Maybe some of you have seen it. I said, if US, Japan, and Europe fell into balance sheet recession, Europe will have the most difficulties because the Maastricht Treaty, as it's written today, cannot handle balance sheet recession at all. The, gov the treaty says you, you, the government can only borrow 3% of GDP. Well, that's fine when the private sector is maximizing profits and so forth. But when the private sector is 10%, saving 10% of GDP, government can borrow only 3% of it, what happens to the remaining seven? There is no provision in the treaty what to do with the remaining seven. But if you do nothing about it, those economies will shrink in 7% per year. 
And so I think we need to correct that problem. And once that cor problem is corrected, I think Eurozone can function quite nicely as its uh, creators have hoped. And because it, these two uh, reforms don't cost German taxpayers anything, uh, maybe we can move forward on those reforms. Thank you very much. Martin Wolf. Okay. Is, oh, is that your? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Pointer. Thought it was a control. Okay. That's very interesting. Okay. It's very difficult to be the last speaker, uh, particularly when one largely agrees with uh, one's predecessors. Uh, but I'm going to sort of split the difference between Bill, Bill and uh, Richard in my analysis of what's happened. I won't go back over the last 40 years, will happen to, you will be happy to know, but I'll make two preliminary points. The first is the principal actor desiring the currency union was without the slightest doubt France, and the principal actor insisting that it could not be a true political union was France, and the, re the implications of that, despite my long history of criticizing the economic policies of the German government, on which I, for which I've been very, very unpopular, and which I continue to, to stand by, I think this disaster, and it is a disaster, a true disaster for Europe, um, is uh, ultimately the responsibility of France, which incidentally is the country that has had the total fixation with fixed exchange rate that Bill correctly mentioned. So I want to state this at the beginning. This was not Germany's fault. They got into this because they felt they couldn't say no. And the second point I wanted to make is I have been absolutely consistent in thinking this was a really bad idea for essentially the reasons Bill mentioned. I disagree completely with Richard. I regard the EU as one of the greatest achievements of Europe and a tremendous post-war success. And I regard the creation of the Eurozone in the, in the phrase I used in a column I wrote in 1991 after, uh, after the Master Treaty was finished. I said that this will uh, remind us fairly soon of the famous description of Greek tragedy. Uh, the famous classical description of a Greek tragedy is hubris, arte, nemesis, arrogance or pride, folly, destruction. And that seems to me what was created, and so that was one of my, I think, better uh, predictions, along with all the, the completely wrong ones, which you can easily discover. Okay, uh, which, which, uh, we'll, which we'll come to. So that's my background, that's my view of what happened. Uh, I'm going to cover four topics, I'm going to cover them very briefly, because a lot of it goes over ground you've already seen. First of all, I'm not going to start right, right back in the history, what I call the illusions of the honeymoon, because I think of this as a very bad mon monetary marriage. It's a very bad marriage. These people should never have got married. Um, now they're living in this very bad marriage. They're really very unhappy. Uh, and, of course, if they could find a way, as Bill suggests, to, uh, to divorce nicely, neatly, cleanly, uh, many of them would be quite happy to do so. Of course, there are others who, who are trying to join, and actually some of the ones who are trying to join are quite right to join. But there are some that clearly would like to leave. Unfortunately, it's virtually impossible to do so. I'll explain. And then I'll talk about my own views of what a better marriage might be like. Okay, honeymoon illusions. Well, the first point about it is we saw the emergence of extraordinary imbalances within the Eurozone uh, as a result of the euphoria in the global financial system and within the Eurozone itself. Uh, we saw the emergence of 
or, or the re-emergence of an enormous German current account surplus. That's already been mentioned. And we've seen extraordinary swings, uh, devastating in their implications in the mood of the financial markets and their willingness to finance uh, cross-border flows. This is a discussion of balance of payments. Uh, so let me start then with the latter. This is, I think, a sort of described perfectly from pessimism to euphoria to pessimism. Again, it's the spread on government 10-year bonds uh, over bonds for Italy and Spain. So back in the 1990s, uh, they were unbelievably high, which is, of course, why they wanted to go in. And then there was a very long period when the markets, God bless them, decided, and it was really a market decision, that German, Spanish, Italian, uh, Irish uh, bonds were exactly perfect equivalents for bonds. Indeed, there was, as I like to joke, a point at which Irish bonds, and it wasn't much before the crisis, were actually cheaper or more expensive, depending on how you look at it. They had lower yields than bonds. And then, of course, the crisis hit and people said well, this was the great oops moment of the world. My God, what are we doing holding this stuff? And you see what happened. And we had the classic panic, flight of capital, uh, self-fulfilling runs in a system perfectly designed not to adjust to it. Because all adjustment, of course, within the Eurozone, with no exchange rate flexibility, goes through quantities. It doesn't go through prices other than over years and years and years of painful adjustment of relative prices in the real sector. And above all, the financial sector adjusts so much more quickly than the real sector. And that's what we've been struggling with ever since. This is sort of Peter's chart put in a slightly different way. This is the Eurozone balance of payments. The red line shows the surplus, the balance of the Eurozone as a whole relative to GDP. And indeed, that red line shows just how massively it shifted into surplus. Surplus. I regard this as a global beggar my neighbor policy. That's what's happened. Huge surpluses emerged in Germany and other creditor countries in the early years. I don't need to repeat why that happened. The other, the dominant other creditor, by the way, was the Netherlands in this picture. And they were perfectly matched. Uh, again, this has been brought out by huge private sector booms, predominantly not public sector boom. The only country where there was a huge fiscal explosion as well as a private one was Greece. And the dominant player in that, that blue rectangle at the bottom is in fact in scale is Spain. Spain became the borrower of the system. Indeed, it was the country through which the ECB's monetary policy really worked. In a sense, that's how the ECB managed to achieve its 2% inflation target. It generated, and the world helped along with all the processes you know, a massive consumer boom. And then it blew up. Uh, the processes that Richard described are the ones underneath it, and you have a massive contraction. And the IMF, this is actually October, twin, October 24, 13 forecast, thinks that by 2018, every single country in the Eurozone will be running a current account surplus, except a very small deficit. I think it's in Finland. And of course, the rest of the world will have to live with the pleasures of absorbing this. And Daniel Gross, of all people, of the Center for European Policy Studies, who's a sound and orthodox young man, has actually rightly argued this is one of the reasons that the emerging economies are now in such problems. So that was a tremendous success, not. Now, let's go on to the next thing. We're living now in the consequence, which is a really very miserable marriage. The honeymoon is truly over. We have deep depressions. We have secular stoic stagnation, Eurozone style. And that really is meaningful. We have lots of countries which are going to have lost decades or even lost 15 years before their GDP gets back to the starting point. GDP in Greece, if you believe in the figures, has declined by 25%. Real domestic demand in Spain has declined by 18%, but the actual GDP before was only 9% because they have achieved a spectacular current account turnaround from a 10% of GDP deficit to approximately 4 or 5% surplus in a very short period. It's an amazing adjustment, but of course at the price of an immense depression. They, we now face deflation, lowflation, and pains of adjustment. 
uh, yields have recently declined. I'm going to come to that, but they are remain painfully high. So this is what's happened to GDP in the Eurozone. Greece makes all these figures look really rather weird, but there are several, three things you need to draw from that. First, the Eurozone has absolutely zero growth since 2009, to all intents and purposes. It's completely flat. That's the red line. So macro performance of the Eurozone as a whole is a disaster, and the ECB has clearly failed on every possible criterion, reaching its price stability target, in reaching a reasonable nominal GDP to target, and as a result, the real GDP has gone nowhere. Uh, Greece, uh, sorry, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, and Italy have all experienced very deep recessions, with GDP falling 6 to, to 9%. Um, there, are, there are recoveries now emerging in Portugal and Ireland in particular and in Spain, but they are weak and unemployment, though I don't have the time to show it, remains very, very high. And the Greek depression is truly spectacular um, and you see that uh, out there. Um, uh, it's, one of the great, uh, it's one of the great economic catastrophes of history. There's no, there's no doubt about this. Now, why has this happened? Well, uh, Richard, this is just looks at the competitiveness indicators. These are whole economy unit labor costs relative to Germany. It's not an ideal indicator, but it'll do well enough for our purposes. And it, you can see there was indeed massive losses of competitiveness and recovery, partial recovery, uh, but only partial recovery for these countries. I haven't put Greece in because the figures aren't available. There are a couple of very important implications of this picture. First, nobody has regained the competitiveness they lost. Nobody. And Germany was imbalanced at the beginning. So there was, they're reasonable to believe that Germany was roughly in equilibrium at the start. And they've none of them regained it, got nowhere yet. Second, Italy is going nowhere, which is really worrying. It's far and away the most important country of these crisis hit countries. And the third point, which isn't in here, but is very important, is the dominant reason for improvements in unit labor costs is simply soaring unemployment. Nominal wage adjustment has been relatively modest. It's been overwhelmingly through soaring unemployment. And what's making this worse now, and this is the overall inflation, this shows core inflation in Germany, Italy, and Spain. So Germany is green, Italy is blue, and Spain is, is red. And the story you will reach from this, again, it's not a perfect indicator, is the way they are, are regaining, the only way they can regain competitiveness consistently, if it's not going to be through soaring unemployment, is through deflation. Spain is now effectively in deflation. Um, and that, of course, makes management of the huge private and public debts generated in this crisis very, very difficult. There has been a remarkable success, particularly of the Outright Monetary Transactions Program, which I show here. Uh, you can see this is one of the most beautiful charts, I think. You see the Outright Monetary Transactions announcement, and immediately, which is a, something that many of us call the ECB to do, immediately you start seeing this uh, contraction of yields in Germany and, it, and Spain and Italy, and you see this uh, very dramatically going, going down. Um, so I, by the way, but regard the OMT program as a complete fraud. It couldn't possibly work. But that doesn't matter. The markets were convinced. I will never, of course, ever get intelligent enough to understand how markets work. So they have decided it's completely safe. But even at these levels, with these spreads, real interest rates are strongly positive in stagnant economies. This means very, very tight fiscal decisions indefinitely. So what on earth are we going to do about this? Well. Basically, there are, it seems to me, two possibilities that are plausible. One is you break it up. If you start thinking about break up, Bill mentioned it, it is, of course, possible to break anything up. We know this very well. Partial breakups, I wrote this about Greece, will generate runs across the system and return the whole system. As soon as it's not seen as fundamentally unbreakable, it becomes a very, very sticky peg, very, very fixed, but not really fixed peg system. So once one country goes, the whole regime changes. And that's very difficult to manage. It's why they, in the end, decided to keep Greece in and, and help it in. Second, a comprehensive breakup means something like exchange controls everywhere, everywhere, a negotiation of unbelievable bitterness on how to break up. There are many different possibilities. I've 
proposed sum. Um, a huge legal mess, because lots of the debt is now in foreign law, in foreign law. So lots of Greek debt is in British law, and who the hell knows what British courts will determine is the appropriate value of the debt, of this debt. In the meantime, by the way, while we've got all these exchange currency law, trade in Europe just sort of stops. That's what happens. In other words, we generate a huge depression. So I tend to feel leaving aside the political consequences of this, that a divorce is of course possible, but it is not something to be undertaken lightly. They designed a system which was supposed to be irre irrevocable, and it damn nearly is. So this then leads to the hope, well, can you make it better within the boundaries of the obviously very difficult political constraints of all these countries who really don't trust one another? They didn't trust one another much before, and they certainly trust one another less now. There's no doubt about that. Anyone who wanders around Europe, as I do, talking to officials, business people, that's pretty clear. Well, it seems to me there are the following four minimum requirements. I won't discuss why I don't think Richard's solutions will work. We can discuss that later. First, there has to be a commitment to symmetrical adjustment of income and spending. One way or another, there has to be symmetrical adjustment, i.e. there must be some way of generating increased demand in core countries. Getting it done through the external side, turning the Eurozone into a great big Germany, won't work at two levels. One, the exchange rate will work against you, inevitably work against you. It will go up and that makes it much more, uh, uh, much more difficult. And secondly, the Eurozone is almost as big as the US. It's too big to get export-led growth. It's crazy to try that. So there must be symmetrical adjustment of income and spending. I don't care whether the Germans have a private sector boom or a uh, tax savings or have a fiscal boom. Somehow or other, there has to be that adjustment. The ECB has to be prepared to finance adjustment. And through the great OMT and other mechanisms, the target system, they haven't done a terrible job of that. And Mario has been incredibly intelligent. But of course, it needs a much more expansionary monetary policy. Now they have to get away from the deflation risk. And that means, of course, they have to do something. We discussed something, what it would be to get real demand going. There will, and this is where I think I disagree with Richard, the balance sheet recession will be solved and must be solved through debt restructuring. There is no other way. There is no, I don't see any way, for example, of introducing risk weights, which actually tell the Greek banks they ought to invest in the riskiest debt in the world rather than the least risky. I mean, that sort of seems to me pretty perverse with all respect. And finally, reforms. Well, there has to be a banking union worked works, which means there must be some fiscal backstop for it. Not a necessarily enormous, but some. I believe bank, the banking systems needs an absolutely safe asset other than the, the debt of one government, which doesn't want to increase it, which means there must be some version of euro bonds. It can be limited to, say, 60% of GDP with the national governments responsible for the rest. I don't see the problem with that. There's no doubt the eurozone could handle that. Uh, the ECB must be made free to, freer to act, and as I've already implied, there must be a degree of fiscal union. I will be told by all my friends in the Eurozone that that is impossible. All the, this very minimum federal union is impossible, and my answer to that is, if that is the case, sooner or later this will break. You will be in divorce, and it will be a catastrophe. So you have to choose between something you really, really dislike and something you absolutely hate. And my view is choose, choose what you dislike. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I have the, uh, the much easier role up here. Each of our esteemed panelists has the task of being as smart as some of the smartest people in the world. And my job is to be as ignorant as the most ignorant person in the room, whoever you are. Um, Bill, I'm going to start with you. It seems to me uh, you're calling for an end to the euro. Uh, do we agree, and maybe everybody can weigh in on this, do we agree that the common currency could have been better constructed? In other words, as a concept, we know it works. It works in America. But, but that these issues around fiscal unity were really the problem. And that if we could go back in time and, for instance, I've seen one suggestion that makes sense to me, rather than a true federal fiscal system, maybe you could have, a, I think, what you would call a extra market, excess surplus recycling, we call it equalization. Maybe that would be enough. 
the, uh, I think all the speakers have identified that that's the problem. Uh, you, you can't run a, a federation uh, where there's so much interdependence, where you've got uh, individual states within that federation gaming each other, and particularly the stronger states uh, uh, being better gamers than the weaker states. And you also can't have a federal system like they have without having some capacity at a, at a, to manage cyclical swings. And, and the fact is that you know, they, when the Maastricht Treaty was agreed in 1991, the, it was admitted that the stability and pact rules were just purely arbitrary. I mean, the French guy who came up with the 3% rule for Mitterrand earlier in the 80s said that they just were instructed one night that uh, to come up with a, low, a percentage figure rather than the amount, the size of the deficit in francs, because the size of the deficit in francs was huge, and the three percent sounded small. And uh, uh, they were one night in the Ministry of Finance, they came up with a three percent rule. It was just a, and and the point was that then they backfilled that rule with all the, the European Commission published a number of papers after that uh, in the 90s, trying to claim that that rule was was viable. But we saw that the output gaps, the swings, were were so big. Uh, in, in 2008, that that rule was breached just from the automatic stabilisers. And, and it, it couldn't possibly work within that rule without a, without a federal fiscal authority that wasn't bound by that rule. Now, I agree with Martin that if, uh, if the ECB could... Uh, 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 eliminate its, Deutsch, its uh, Bundesbank culture. I mean, you know, there were fights about where the uh, European Central Bank would be, and uh, uh, the uh, German government insisted it be near the Bundesbank to give up the Deutschmark. And, but if, if the ECB was, uh, would fund national government deficits who were subject to asymmetrical shocks, then you could get away with a, without having a fiscal capacity at the national level, but that's not going to happen either. So a functioning federation, everyone has to, you know, in Australia, for example, uh, Queensland had terrible floods in, in uh, 2012. A uh, few billion dollars immediately were required. Uh, uh, we might have some contestability about football games and, and cricket matches between the states, but nobody in Australia blinked an eyelid when the federal government announced next morning they were going to increase their spending by $2 billion, it was all going to go to Queensland to fix the floods. And it, that would be impossible in Europe at this moment. There'd be such a screaming out, outrage. Well, so let, Richard called the creation of the European Union one of mankind's greatest achievements. And I think, uh, although Martin doesn't agree, many would. Uh, could the European Union have uh, thrived and achieved what it did without a common currency. Should it have stopped there? Richard. Well, I'm sure you would have strived to some extent, but having a common currency, much deeper markets for private sector uh, to exploit and gain efficiency, gain productivity gains, all of that, I think, is something we should not give up easily. That's why I, my proposal, having a different risk weights just for the government bond market, allows private sector to do whatever they want. The, only the government bond market has to have that little risk weights so that all the gains that I'm sure Europe have uh, appreciated over the last 10 years, much bigger market for all the companies within the Eurozone, uh, so that they can have more productivity gains, efficiency gains, those will be still in place. Only the government bond market will be, will be restricted. And I just want to add one more point that even if this is all understood, you know, German politicians have told the German people that we did all the structural reform, the southern Europeans did nothing. It's until southern Europeans did everything, we're not going to help them. And I find that very unfortunate because it was the Southern Europeans that were, in some sense, sacrificed to save the German economy. And German economy was the segment of Europe 10 years ago. 
they were not doing all that well 10 years earlier. And it was all saved by Southern Europeans having this huge bubble. And so the lack of synchronicity within the Eurozone is something we have to take into account. And for that reason, I think we have to, especially if they are in balance sheet recessions where monetary policy is largely useless, then we need to have another special provision within the Maastricht Treaty for those economies. Martin, you, you may want to respond. I, I know you've also, you also suggest uh, that a large-scale euro bond market would be one of the, the fixes and that it is achievable, as you say. Uh, would that be better than what Richard is proposing in terms of risk weighting? Uh, and would that not actually get us a, a lot closer to a kind of a mental integration that doesn't exist today? Let me just make two points. One on the, um, the German restructuring and the current restructuring. I mean, Germany is clearly correct. It did a lot of structural reform. We can discuss the welfare effects Bill did, and I think he's right. Um, but it was lucky enough, quote unquote, it did so in the context of a global boom and a European boom. Uh, and by the way, it started off with a very low external, I mean, it wasn't in serious imbalance. I, I think the sick man of Europe thing was always great and exaggerated. I, there's a lot of history about that. Doesn't matter. The point is they're now asking these countries to go through a whole set of very radical structural reforms whose main effect is massively to increase unemployment on top of a huge cyclical downturn whose effect is massively to increase unemployment. And this has pretty clear political consequences. If you go around Southern Europe, just talk to ordinary people, as far as they're concerned, not the politicians will never be honest about it because they can't, with few exceptions, they will say, what does Europe stand for? It stands for depression. This is not, that's not a basis to make the European project work. It stands for depression. So this is, it seems to me, a medium to long-term political catastrophe for Europe. And I think people in Brussels and in some parts of Northern Europe are far too complacent about the consequences. And that, I think, comes out of this panel. Now, then you get into the technical means. We can discuss very many policies. For various for reasons I sort of indicated, I don't believe in, in Richard's particular alternative. But the basic point is pretty clear. You need the capacity to respond to massive asymmetric shocks symmetrically. So that was a key point I made. So it falls on both sides. Uh, you know, I take the view that creditors and debtors are both responsible for financial crises, not just debtors. Uh, to put it mildly, the creditors were providing the heroin and the debtors shot it. Now, the, the, so both sides are responsible. That means financing in the short run and adjustment in the medium to long run. Just, that's the theme. We can discuss at great length the technical ways of doing that. I regard Eurobonds as valuable because it provides a fiscal backstop, which is essential. It doesn't need to be at that scale, I think, for running a proper European banking system. Banking systems need impeachably safe assets, and the only ones that make sense in a union like this are either the German debt, which seems to me completely crazy, or European debt. So I think that doesn't need to be at this scale. But somehow or other, they need the capacity to finance and adjust, uh, and that has to be symmetrical. And that means creditor countries have responsibilities within this system. It's one of the consequences of joining a currency union. And I would agree that the creditor countries have benefited from this currency union very substantially. And all you need to think about, and I did have this in my paper, what would happen if it broke up? Well, the one thing we know, quite apart from this complete mess, which we, I was discussing, is the new DMARC would go through the roof. And it would have the same problems that the Japanese have been having. So it seems to me Germany has a very, very large interest, and they know it, in, in maintaining the union. And I think they should realize, I hope they will realize in the end, even if they never wanted it, that they could do it on better terms. Did you have a response, Richard? Well, uh, everything has to be symmetric, I agree. But as I showed in my, one of my charts, those countries, except Greece, actually have huge domestic savings. They don't need German money. As long as their own money goes to, to their own government bond market, or just half of their savings going to their own government bond market, bonds, bond yields will come down, and we won't be discussing this Eurozone crisis today. If Spain were outside the Eurozone, Spanish bond yields would be probably lower than British bond yields by now, because the amount of savings that uh, Spanish private sector is generating. And they will have balance sheet recessions, but they will be 
there will be no Eurozone crisis. They, they, they will have a fiscal space because the private sector is saving so much money. But because they are in the Eurozone, because money can fly in and out so easily, that's why they have the problem they face. So why don't we do something about that particular issue so that Spanish savings will go to Spanish government bond market? I want to, I want to bring Peter in. Um, Peter, I read a paper that you wrote uh, that compared the European experience to one that America went through, America being the great example of successful fiscal and monetary union. And at the end of the paper, I think you concluded by saying, I hope it ends as well. Uh, what it, what it, we haven't heard from you. We have a view here that the, uh, the euro should be disbanded. We have a view that it uh, shouldn't, and we have a view that it should, but it won't be. Well, I'm going to answer a slightly different question uh, than that. But, really? Uh, That's if not you'll the way this works. Me. Yeah, as well. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that, uh, you know, this is all a quite consistent story between us, that the uh, thing is that here is with great sophistication, we've all said the same thing, which is the unreality and the need for things there. But outside the sophistication of this audience, there is this belief in magic that they can export their way out of all the difficulties. And as I said, exports, more net exports means more savings. More savings get you into this paradox of thrift and into the depression chronicled like this. And so they have to somehow get out of this magical way of trying to export their troubles elsewhere. One of the speakers called it beggar thy neighbor, a traditional kind of, of uh, expression for this, and to confront the real problems. And we have very sophisticated solutions presented here, uh, but politically, nobody is talking to them because they're all still hoping that magic will hold on. For the United States, if you want that comparison, the uh, Comparison is that we started a currency union in the late 18th century, which worked sort of well with a lot of crises and troubles in there. Uh, and then we fought a terrible civil war because of disagreements, just as we're talking in Europe between the North and the South, between the North and the South of the, uh, uh, of the United States. After that, and after a lot of other things that went on, smaller things, the currency union began to work rather well. But that's a long kind of 70-year process to make the whole thing work with a lot of bloodshed, a lot of problems, all sorts of things that are not quite symmetrical with Europe. But one might think from the talks we've had today uh, could be comparable. Martin, do you believe that absent the credit crisis and the, the shocks that that created, uh, you would feel as strongly about this? In other words, I understand you were never in favor of, of the currency, but it deteriorated the way it did because of uh, the events of the last five or six years. Um, I must comment, I mean, Peter's comment is, if, if Europe requires 70 years, including a civil war, this is not a great policy recommendation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And some of us would say the American Currency Union really didn't work until they got through the Great Depression. So we're talking about even, 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 uh, even longer. I think the answer to yours is, uh, let me be clear, the, the scale of the crisis that eventuated and its speed was much worse than I had anticipated. There may be others on the panel who were wiser than I. But it seemed to me that the basic point is this. The structure that had been created was one that had no means of coping with large real or financial shocks that were asymmetric in their effects. The fact that the way the process worked in the context of those early years happened to coincide with a gigantic global credit boom that went, as I put it in my right, right but within Europe, separating them out, the discussion of that is very good, meant that when the crisis hit, it was simultaneously a monstrous financial crisis, a monstrous competitiveness crisis, and therefore a monstrous economic and political crisis altogether. That's worse than I think most of us would have guessed 
But one could reasonably say the system wasn't equipped very well to even deal with minor crises. Um, and the reason, it's very important to, to, to clarify because Richard's got, I think, half of the answer, which is there's a flow of fund problem, creating, that's the balance sheet recession, and you should absorb the excess savings. Unfortunately, there is also a long-term internal competitiveness problem. Which, and the difference between Japan, the UK, on the one hand, and Spain, say now, is Spain can't devalue. And the way Spain is devaluing, and it is devaluing, I've discussed it, they, they are going to deflation, is going to increase the real level of their debt extremely rapidly. And there, I happen to, didn't put in the chart on what happened to public sector debt. It, it is an explosive path, and it isn't Japan. Now, if you had completely captive savings, not just uh, these risk weights, it might work, but I think Richard's, I'm, you know, I just don't think Richard's proposal will do enough I would, it needs some other things as well, and I don't think this one, one would fly, but that's another matter. But the crucial point is, when this system imploded, you have a financial sector crisis and a competitiveness crisis and a classic Keynesian savings investment crisis all together. And you have to have mechanisms that will deal with all of them. And at the moment, basically, it's the ECB. Bill? Yeah, what, I, what I'd say about America and what the crisis has taught us is that the crisis that Europe found in 2008 was just a, a magnified version of what they were already doing in the 90s. I mean, the, the convergence process, even though it was fraught with uh, tricks and accounting frauds, the co convergence process was the start of the bias towards austerity and the persistence locking in of unemployment. They never really grew properly after that. They never really allowed the balances to work, to work to offset each other at all. The biases were already there before the crisis truly hit. And what the crisis has taught us around the world is that the, the true federations, that those that with the, with the st fiscal stabilisation capacity, like America and like Australia, they, they, Europe got locked into the mentality that came from the academy and we're responsible. I, I'm, I'm in an academy that's responsible that denied that fiscal policy could be effective. And we had the arrogance of my profession talking about this thing, the great moderation. And you had Nobel Prize winners saying that the, virtually the business cycle is dead. The only thing left for governments to do is more microeconomic reform. There was this lethargy, this smug arrogance, this denial. And that permeated, that's what I talked about, the monetarist overlay. That permeated the whole structure of the creation of the treaty in Maastricht. And what the crisis has taught us by Obama's stimulus, even though it was far too small, and certainly by the stimulus in Australia, which was relatively large and very quick, Australia didn't have a recession. We had a massive fiscal stimulus in 2008, which prevented us from having a recession. We're an extremely open economy, so we should have felt all of the trade effects. Our exchange rate went crazy, but we didn't have a recession because we had the demand offset to the private sector collapse, which we did have. And the recession has taught us around the world that fiscal policy is highly effective and monetary policy is less effective, which was what the Keynesian thinking process was. The Europeans haven't yet got that. They're still denying that fiscal policy is effective. So with a, with a view to staying on time, and we don't have a lot of time, uh, I think what, one of the points of the Institute for New Economic Thinking is to uh, incorporate the humanities, the politics, uh, and not make economics something that happens on a, on a page. Just briefly, all of you, we've identified the politics of this situation as the problem. Whether, the, whether you disband the euro or you try to improve the euro, that is the problem. I'm going to start with you, Peter, and just write down the line as quick as you can, but are you optimistic about the politics, the imperative of it actually helping to shape it in a way that ends well? I see nothing in the current environment that see, looks to me like they're willing to think hard about the issues that we've raised. Bill? No, there's nothing optimistic. Europe, Europe's, the, history of, the, the history of modern Europe has been protractedness, 
In other words, they take a ages to get anywhere. Uh, when they do get there, the decisions are always so compromised they're not effective. They still hate each other. They have no cultural convergence. And they should be separate economies, looking after their own individual people with their separate econ economic policy. Richard? No. <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm actually optimistic. Oh, good. Because <laughs> I think solutions are there. If Europeans look at what happened to Japan, what happened to the United States, for that matter? The government came out and says, let's not fall off the fiscal cliff. And of course, the US came mighty close to it with sequester and then government shutdown and uh, debt limits. It managed to stay away from the fiscal cliff. And now, after five years, six years, balance sheets are becoming cleaner. We, we're going to get into another set of problems, what I call a uh, QE trap as a result. But uh, leaving that aside, the you know, US is doing much better because it learned from the Japanese mistakes. Officials understood not to make the same mistake the Japanese government made in 1997, which was a premature fiscal consolidation, and Japan fell into a massive uh, recession. And it took Japan 10 years to climb out of that. U.S. looked at all that and made good use of it. But you don't see any European leaders saying, let's not fall off the fiscal cliff. Quite the contrary. They're all saying, let's go fall off the fiscal cliff. And of course, they'll fall off the fiscal cliff, and they're in very sad shape. But it's not that they don't have a solution. There is a solution, and once they understand it, and I, I've been invited to Europe very often these days. I just flew in from Europe on, on this as well. They're beginning to listen to this kind of talk, even in Germany, and if more and more people get to this idea that, oh, it, once you view it in this way, it, it, you can actually solve these problems. But you know, if you tell a lie 100 times, people eventually believe it. They told that Southern Europeans are lazy, and they did that for so long. So it may take a while for them to turn the steering wheel, but I think it's entirely possible. Can we stay optimistic, Martin? Um, conditionally. Uh, <laughs> first of all, I was going to introduce my presentation uh, by saying, what, was, what on earth has this got to do with a conference about innovation? Um, well, I suppose the euro, as Richard reminded us, was a remarkable innovation. Yeah. Um, half-baked, but it was a remarkable innovation and a remarkable bet on history, right? Um, so the optimistic view would be it was a bet on history. It was incredibly bold. It hasn't gone perfectly well. There has, in fact, I don't have time to go through this, been an immense amount of innovation in the last few years, some of which have been sensible and some of which has not. They haven't got yet to the point at which it is clearly going to work. Uh, Richard's proposal, if enough I bought it, only deals with the demand side. There's also a competitiveness adjustment side, which is a big part of this story. But it is not inconceivable, given the agony that divorce would create, and this is where I part from Bill, I mean real political and economic disaster, that confronted with that, and I think they're still confronted with that, it's not over, that they will continue to be pressed and forced unwillingly to, to create a policy regime that will work. And it is not impossible to think of one that will work better than now and, doesn't, and avoids breakup. I don't think it's impossible at all. It's just difficult. And if you're optimistic about human creativity, you can believe that they will do it. And I'll throw in one other optimism. There is nothing like an external enemy for getting people together. And Russia's doing a great job. <laughs> Please join me in thanking our panelists. Peter, Bill, Richard, Martin.